morning again. Did you know that Moses had an Ethiopian wife? Well, Aaron and Miriam, Moses' older brother and sister, used this and spoke against him when trying to usurp his authority. Numbers 12 verse 1 and 2 says this, And Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Has he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. Aaron and Miriam did have a valid point because according to God's law, Moses should not have married a foreign wife. But the Lord heard it and took offence when they spoke against Moses, even though they were older than him and were apparently right. God came to Moses' defence very suddenly, calling the three of them to the tabernacle and telling them plainly that Moses was his choice, his friend, and that they should not have dared to speak to him like that. God's anger rose up against them and Miriam was struck with leprosy. Why did God defend Moses even though he'd violated a commandment? Well, the answer is in verse 3. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. When you read this account, it seems Moses hardly had time to defend himself, even if he'd wanted to, because God intervened immediately. That's what God does for the meek. But just look at Moses' attitude. Not only did he refuse to defend himself, but also he refused to bear a grudge. Instead of adopting a serves your right attitude towards Miriam. It says in verse 13 that Moses cried unto the Lord saying, heal her now, O God, I beseech you. I can only assume you've had lots of opposition and many setbacks during your lifetime, just like me. I do remember one period in my life when I desperately needed a regular job. And after hours of scouring the newspapers for job vacancies, I'd write to firms asking for interviews, but always seemed to get letters back saying things like, we thank you for replying to our advertisement, but the response was so great that we are unable at this time to offer you an interview. Although I was getting used to receiving these, the sick feeling in the pit of my stomach was still there. I needed a permanent job. After seven years of working for the church on a voluntary basis and being housed for that period by a couple of members, I now found myself in a flat on my own again. The fact that I hadn't worked in offices for the previous seven years wasn't helping the situation as technology had improved and advanced at a tremendous rate. In my last employment, an electric typewriter proved that you were a worthy secretary. But now people were using electronic typewriters and word processors. I knew these inventions had been brought out to make the secretary's life easier, but my potential bosses were always reluctant to take on inexperienced employees. Well, for a while I found work through a temporary services agency but was always on the lookout for a permanent position, as I needed a regular salary to pay my rent and bills. So I found it quite amusing to actually be assigned temporary work in one of the companies I'd been refused even an interview, especially as the job I'd applied for hadn't yet been filled, and that was the job I was assigned to do. William Press and Leonard Fairclough, two big property development companies, had amalgamated to become AMEC Properties and were setting up a branch office in the centre of Manchester. Because the company was brand new and there were only a few employees, my role was that of Girl Friday, which meant doing anything for anybody. <laughs> and I loved every minute of it, from washing pots and brewing up to taking shorthand notes at board meetings. I found it challenging and exciting and had an overview of the whole of the company's dealings. I did my job well, and it wasn't long before I was asked to stay on as a permanent member of staff. By now, a lot of other people had also been employed for specific jobs, and we were all told there were prospects for promotion in the future as the company developed. To be honest, 
I wouldn't have, it wouldn't have mattered to me what I did because my priority was bringing home a regular income. But as more staff came in on the ground level, I found myself being promoted extremely rapidly until I became personal assistant to the senior surveyor. As the manager and his secretary, together with a few surveyors, had already been transferred from another branch of William Fairclough to set up this company, it came as quite a surprise to realise I'd actually landed the highest job available to staff being recruited. My job entitled me to a superb salary, plus a clothing allowance, as I would be in regular contact with the clients, and as I was representing my company, which had worldwide repute, I was expected to dress with class. While setting up the company, we had to work around builder's rubble as the premises had not yet been fully refurbished. And that meant that the secretaries and clerical staff all had to share a general office together. Now, I loved my work, but I found it very difficult to cope with the envy stirred up in the hearts of the people I was working with. And the girls in my office were particularly hurtful with their snide remarks. My years of voluntary work for the church had a profound effect upon me. And I, I no longer wanted to argue or retaliate to their provocation. Instead, I tried to make peace, hoping that kind words would make a difference. But instead of appeasing them, it seemed my behaviour incensed them all the more. And they saw my kindness as creeping. And even in intimated I was acting with such innocence when all the time I was covering up my deceitful condescension. Their ac accusations bemused me but no matter what I did I couldn't convince them. Things went from bad to worse and I went through a particularly harrowing time when all the girls sent me to Coventry. I would never have believed that such a schoolgirl prank could hurt a grown woman so effectively. For days on end I was totally ignored. They'd neither look at nor speak to me. And when communication was absolutely essential, they'd leave curt little notes on my desk. I felt totally alone and unwanted as they laughed, joked and ridiculed over my head. Although I loved the job, I hated this working environment and desperately wanted to leave. But I'd already experienced how hard it was to find a permanent position with a stable income. I knew God had allowed this trial for some reason, and although I tried hard to put on a brave face, my heart was crying out for help. My boss asked me what the problem was, but I hadn't known him for very long, so I, I didn't feel confident to share my feelings. Fortunately, he could see for himself, so took the situation into his own hands. And within a matter of days, my desk and typewriter had been transferred from the general office to his own. I was then told that from now on I'd be working in his office, <laughs> something which was totally unheard of. The girls in the general office were infuriated by this action, but it was a tremendous blessing for me to be away from their cynical attitudes. I felt like a maiden being rescued by a knight in shining armour, and under his protection I became more and more involved in my job, and my potential seemed boundless. Our working relationship couldn't have been better. And I often felt as though I knew the job so well that I was literally an extension of my boss. Well, as the months passed, God began to work and I could see my patience paying off as one by one, my enemies began to leave and replacements found to fill their positions. By this time, all the refurbishment to our offices were completed and we were resituated. I was placed in an office next to my boss, which was quite apart from everyone else. Some time later, the existing manager left and a new one came in. After a week of working in the department, he made a request to our head office in London that I be moved from my present position to work as his personal assistant on the grounds that I knew the job so well. <laughs> my boss jubilantly informed me that this request had been overruled by the managing director who regularly made visits to our Manchester branch because he'd recognised my boss and I made an excellent team and he was very reluctant to break it up. This type of loyalty from bosses was totally alien to me. 
And as I viewed my situation, I was constantly amazed to see how God had removed all my enemies and placed allies alongside me who respected rather than resented me for the position I was in. And the clients wind and dine me so regular that I sometimes wondered who was more important, the boss or the assistant. Well, as it happened, touring engagements for the ministry became more regular. And although I was allotted quite a number of weeks holiday each year, these still weren't enough and I had to ask for more time off. Even though I requested leave without pay, I found that the company was still paying my salary, which made it increasingly difficult to ask for time off. Consequently, I handed in my notice as the ministry was taken over. But even then, my bosses tried to work out a situation where they could still employ me. <laughs> wow, it was very novel for me to be in such demand, obviously. The end of the story is that I finally left to work full-time for God. But what a testimony to the way God can turn events if we don't retaliate and allow him to deal in all our circumstances as he sees fit. The Bible says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That's Matthew 5 verse 5. And it's referring to the future kingdom. But just imagine what we could enjoy now if only we'd put down our boxing gloves. The Bible says the battle is the Lord's, so let's stop fighting our circumstances. You know, we're not meant to change our circumstances. Truth is, the circumstances are meant to change us. God bless you and have a great week.